this is kind of my passion, and what I'm going to do is uh, what's changing. I, I'm going to take you, I think, through the history and why I th like the groups embraced APC clinics, advanced prostate cancer clinics, uh, IODs, and office dispensing pharmacies, uh, where we've come from and where it's all going. So again, as I showed you before, my disclosures. So we're going to talk about modes of APC currently and the new modes. Um, so why did a bunch of surgeons decide to get into APC, to become like medical oncologists? Uh, well, about eight years ago, we had data from a pharmacy company, the pharmaceutical company that we had worked with in LUGPA that showed that really 30 to 40 percent of revenues and volume of what we do as urologists is in the world of prostate cancer. So it is our bailiwick, and I think if we wanted to keep it in our space, uh, we've all felt that we needed to embrace that. Uh, the so-called soup to nuts, from PSA testing to managing people up to, you know, castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Uh, a lot of us did clinical trials, as Evan had just alluded to, so we were very familiar with a lot of these medications. Most of us did uh, the clinical trials on uh, these medications that are all in this space. And they developed, uh, the LUGPA groups developed a champion, the individual who was going to monitor this clinic and to uh, make it happen and make it work. Uh, I, we profoundly believe that we are able to better track patients We're having our in-office dispensing pharmacies. I was talking to my, uh, my nurse, my oncology nurse yesterday, and, you know, she said without a question, I mean, when patients get drugs from specialty pharmacies uh, like CVS, I mean, we have no idea what's going on. We don't know if they're getting them, if they're taking them. Uh, in our own IOD, and I'm sure in everybody else's, you know, we call these patients every month. We monitor their, uh, their uh, prescription. We make sure they're taking them every day, that there's compliance. Um, you know, we have stories all the time about patients who've passed away and CVS continues to send them medication. So we do think it's far better for patients. And of course, you know, we have to uh, say that there, it's also an ancillary service line. So it's really become another one of um, our group's ancillaries to help support our, uh, our, our group's uh, survival. So I mean, we all started with M1 disease, M1 CRPC, and I'm just going to take you to the history quickly. So IMPACT was 2010. These are the pivotal trials. That was Proven, CIPT, Cougar in 2011 to 2013, so we started using abiraterone. Uh, and then in 12, Affirm came out with enzalutamide, Zofigo 2013 with Alsimca, Prevail in 2014. And then uh, the Proceed Registry helped uh, in 2009, kind of confirming the, uh, all of us in the uro urological world who believe that Provenge is a good uh, addition to the armamentarium. Uh, there was very good data that it indeed had good survival benefit and that it was uh, something that we should all uh, administer to our patients. Uh, I think the big question always, you know, the, is today is still how do we sequence this, and I think, you know, we still aren't, don't have our hands totally around that. Uh, so then came in 2018 and 19, Spartan, Prosper, and Aramis uh, with the M0 space. So the M0 space has been somewhat of an enigma because, uh, this, again, for those who don't do this all the time. M0 are people who've got rising PSAs but have no evidence on AD2 and have no evidence of metastasis. And originally this space from a pharma company uh, was estimated to be about 120,000 patients. You know, in the most recent dialogue with them, it's down to 15,000 patients. Uh, so we don't have OS on these drugs yet. We have MFS, you know, uh, metastasis-free survival. Is that a surrogate? I don't know, it remains to be determined. I think many of us think that it is, but nevertheless, uh, you know, the M0 space, as I said, if you talk to everybody who does this around the country, it really just has not taken hold, I think, uh, as M1, because I just think a lot of us, uh, there's a lot of mitigating factors that go into it. Uh, the PSA doubling time is very important. All the trials really had PSA doubling times of less than 10. And I think that the M0 space is great if you have a guy in his 50s and he has, uh, you know, PSA doubling time of six to eight months and he's got bad disease. Yeah, I mean, that'd be an ideal M0 patient. But the guy who's 80, who's on ADT, who's got multiple comorbidities, 
you know, and now you put him on yet another agent, and you know, maybe his PSA doubling time is 13 or 14 months, and you put him on another agent, and now they have, you know, uh, they have mental optundation, or they fall, they break their hip, and we all know what happens when elderly patients break their hip, so have we really done them any favor? So I think, again, there's a lot of reasons why this M0 space has not really turned into um, uh, what it was originally thought to be. You know, where it will go, uh, going forward remains to be seen. There is, you know, a, a, a good new agent that was added in 2019, and whether that moves the needle at all, I don't know. We'll see. All right. So, uh, castrate sensitive, hormone sensitive, there's about 20 different ways to describe this. Uh, charted latitude stampede, I'm not going to drill down into the details of any of these, but we all know that they really were about aberrant and taxatier. You know, and basically, anybody who comes in de novo with METs now, whether it's a couple nodes or a couple bone lesions or multiple, are now candidates for this. So this, I think, is the space that really is exploding, not only with that, but with the recent Titan in 2019 and Enzimet with Enzo, which, Enzalutamide, which was just given approval in this space. Not only do we have de novo patients, but we have biochemical recurrence patients. And that's really, I think, a huge addition to the armamentarium. So um, now somebody who has failed treatment and just has rising PSA with METs, we can put them on this drug if they've had radical prostates or radiation, and that opens up a whole new space. There's clear survival benefits here. There's OS. Um, I say surprisingly slow uptake only in the sense that <laughs> I know in my group, uh, and this is, this is pretty new. I mean, this is something that's been going on, uh, as I said, for the last uh, a uh, year or less as far as you know, a, a biochemical reoccurrence. Uh, I think that it's like anything else that we do. It, there's just time for uptake, and I think slowly but surely we are getting everybody to realize that without question, you know, these patients need to be on multiple drug therapy. There is, as I say, a survival benefit, and they're going to do better. So we're entering into this era of precision medicine. Uh, you know, where we tailor things to patients, and that encompasses a number of things. Uh, genomics, and we'll talk about in a second, uh, genetic testing, but, you know, ARV7 for splice variants, you know, the 10, 20, 30 rule of uh, who may have that. Uh, is this necessary? Do we need to get this on patients? Do you want to get it before you put them on novel hormonal therapy? If it's a 10 percent, you know, one out of 10, do you want to wait till they fail their first novel before you put them on the second, or you just cut to the chase and switch to chemo? You know, one of these things that's unknown, but it certainly is out there for tailoring treatment for patients, and it's something that is being utilized. I think the hottest thing in the APC block right now is genetic testing. Uh, now it's obviously an NCCN guidelines. You have germline and somatic, you know, those who are born with genetic mutations, those who mutate. Uh, you might have a germline or you might not have a germline and get a somatic or you could mutate later. So if you get a germline and it's negative at some point, you could get a somatic mutation. Uh, it's 5 to 20 percent prevalence in heredity cancer, obviously mismatch repair of DNA, Lynch syndrome, BRCA, BRCA, Hox B13, check 2 uh, multiple family prevalence of uh, multiple cancers. Uh, what this, I think, requires is all of us to be much more vigilant in taking accurate histories of these patients. And I think those of us who deal in the world of APC do this. Uh, I don't know whether our colleagues in the groups are doing this as well. It's, once again, like everything else we do, it's an educational thing. It's kind of pounding people over the head over the weeks, months, and years until ultimately they get it. But I think this is very, very important, uh, not only for the patient, but for all their family members to make sure that they don't have uh, children who are also uh, potentially going to be, uh, have these, uh, these cancers. Uh, I do think there's slow but progressive uptake. I think there's the typical learning curve. Uh, you know, urologists don't want to do genetic counseling. I mean, for obvious reasons, I don't think we have the expertise, the time. Uh, then there's the med mal risk liability. There is not a great abundance of genetic counselors, a bit of a paucity. Getting appointments to have them go in and see genetic counseling can be challenging at times. And these are some of the, uh, the hurdles that we face. I know a lot of the genetic testing companies are having all types of uh, programs to try and do that. So what's on the horizon in my last half a minute here? Obviously, PARP inhibitors, Olaparib, Rucaparib in uh, 2020, they're on the fast track of the FDA. Um, you know, we all know they work on DNA repair mechanisms. I do think that these will have good uptake by the urology groups. They're oral drugs. I think they have a reasonable side effect profile. 
Um, PD drugs, PDL, you know, obviously in bladder cancer, it's being used. It's, a, it's, it's, it's given intravenously, which really isn't a problem for all of us because we give Provenge. But there's potentially more profound side effects, and the uptake of that, you know, may not be quite as swift as the PARPs. So in conclusion, and it's a rapidly evolving space. We're moving towards personalized precision medicine. It's great for patients, and it's great for us. So thank you very much.